As I mentioned uh, this morning, uh, as it's uh, Palm Sunday uh, today, we didn't look at the next part of the Lord's Prayer this morning, but we're going to have a look at it uh, this evening. Um, this prayer is uh, is surely for us to use as it is, and uh, we do that from time to time, but also to use as the pattern and the, 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 the structure of all our, our prayers so that we might pray in the right way. We might have the right things in priority. Uh, we might, uh, we might uh, come to God in the right way, remembering who he is. And uh, prayer in this uh, passage is one of those acts of righteousness that Jesus was uh, teaching about, along with uh, giving and fasting. And we're to do these things and, and by implication, I think, any other acts of righteousness that there are, these are just representative things. Uh, as Jesus says, not to be seen by men, to get a, what it, in fact is a measly reward, isn't it? To just have the praise of others. Not to be seen by men, not to puff ourselves up, rather to do these things in God's sight and for God's glory, to be seen by him. And, uh, and the repeated uh, phrase that Jesus uses is that uh, our father who sees what is done in secret may reward us. That's a far better thing, isn't it, than having someone sort of give us a, a little bit of an applause for something we've done. And so we're to do these things in his sight and uh, for his sake. And uh, we've already talked about the beginning of the prayer, our Father in heaven, he's our Father. So there's that intimacy, that uh, closeness that we come to him uh, through the Lord Jesus. We remember that he's only our Father because Jesus has first uh, called us and saved us and brought us. Uh, so we're able to call him our Father. Uh, and that sets our uh, approach uh, right from the start. He knows our needs. He'll not give us anything that is uh, wrong for us, harmful for us. He wants the best for us. But he's also our Father in heaven, and so we come without being overly familiar and um, and uh, blasé about it. We come remembering his reference and coming rightly to him. We remember who he is, we remember who we are. And so we come with humility and, uh, and devotion, but also with confidence. There's that balance of intimacy and awe. Um, and last time we looked at the first, that first proper petition, um, hallowed be your name. We asked a few questions. Why do we hallow God's name? Uh, God's name, if you remember, stands for all he is and all he does. His character, his being, it's not just a label, it's more than that. And hallowing his name is to bring to mind all that God is and what he's like in his whole being. And uh, to know who he is, to hear the revelation he's given of himself, and to recognise that and to believe it and to be to be constantly aware of his presence and to obey him it means to to make his name holy, to proclaim it and declare it and bring others to do that too. And uh, so that has something to do with our missionary heart. We desire that those who, who don't hallow God's name would come to do so. And so it, it forces us to look outwards to others too. Well, the next petition that we're gonna look at this evening is, uh, is uh, this one, let me put it on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We'll just look at that kingdom part this evening. They're obviously connected, these things, aren't they? Uh, but we're going to think about God's kingdom. And I thought um, it might be helpful. We've watched this video before, I think, um, in the past. But it, there's a video from the Bible Project um, about the gospel of the kingdom. And it picks up a few things that we mentioned this morning about the, the nature of God's kingdom, that it's not like the earthly kingdoms. It's kind of this upside down kingdom. They use that phrase a few times. And uh, just to see how Jesus is the king of that kingdom. And uh, so I think this might be a helpful thing. We'll just pause and watch that for a minute and then we'll, we'll come back. There's this beautiful poem. It's in the book of Isaiah. The city of Jerusalem has just been destroyed by Babylon, a great kingdom in the north. And all of these Jewish people, they've been sent away into exile. But a few remained in the city. And they're left <coughs> wondering, what just happened? Has our God abandoned us? Right, because Jerusalem was supposed to be the city where God would reign over the world to bring peace and blessing to everyone. Now Isaiah had been saying that Jerusalem's destruction was a mess of Israel's own making. They had turned away from their God, become corrupt, and so their city and their temple were destroyed. Yeah, everything seems lost. But the poem goes on. There's a watchman on the city walls. And far out on the hills, we see a messenger. And he's running towards the city. He's running, he's shouting, good news. And Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. 
beautiful feet? Yes, the feet are beautiful because they're carrying a beautiful message. What's the message? That despite Jerusalem's destruction, Israel's God still reigns as king, and that God himself is going to one day return to this city, take up his throne, and bring peace. And the watchmen sing for joy because of the good news that their God still reigns. Now in the New Testament, we find this same phrase, the good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, and it's also sometimes translated with the word gospel. Yeah, so when Christians say, do you believe the gospel, they mean, do you believe the news? But not just any news. In the Bible, this phrase is always about the announcement of the reign of a new king. And in the New Testament, the Gospels use this phrase to summarize all of Jesus' teachings. They say that he went about proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. So Jesus saw himself as the messenger, bringing the news that God reigns. Yes, but the way that he described God's reign, it surprised everybody. I mean, think, powerful, successful kingdom that needs to be strong, able to impose its will, able to defeat its enemies. But Jesus said the greatest person in God's kingdom was the weakest, the one who loves and who serves the poor. And he said that you live under God's reign when you respond to evil by loving your enemies and forgiving them and seeking peace. This is an upside-down kingdom. Now Jesus also said that this kingdom was arriving with him. Yeah, so for example, there's this really interesting story where there's a high-ranking Roman officer, and he comes to Jesus, begging him to heal his servant. And he even calls Jesus his Lord, acknowledging that Jesus is his authority. Jesus praises this man for recognizing what no one else yet had, that not only was Jesus announcing God's kingdom, he was the king. And so the word gets out that this Jewish man from Galilee is talking and acting like he's the king of Israel. He's appointing 12 disciples, which are an image of Israel's 12 tribes. He's healing people, forgiving people their sins. And all of this so threatened Israel's leaders that they finally decide to have him killed. And Jesus let them. Yeah, which is a weird thing to do if you're trying to become king. That's right. But for Jesus, this is what had to happen. Jesus saw the sin and the devastation of his people Israel as just one small part of the entire human condition. How all of humanity has rebelled against God, resulting in the tragedy and devastation of our whole world. So how is God going to bring his reign over such a world? Jesus believed it would be through an act of sacrificial love for his enemies. This is why in the Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion is depicted as his enthronement as the king of the Jews. Yeah, he receives a crown. He also receives a robe. He's exalted up, not onto a throne, but onto the cross. How beautiful are the feet that bring good news. And the good news now is that Jesus has defeated death and that he reigns as king that he's dealt with our sin and corruption himself, and that he's conquered it with his life and with his love. And then Jesus sends his followers to go out and keep announcing this good news of the upside-down kingdom. And to invite everyone to give their allegiance to him, the king who defeated death with his love. I think that's helpful. It picks up a few things that uh, we mentioned this morning and a few things that we're going to mention this evening about uh, the nature of God's kingdom. So I really want to just ask um, just three simple questions. I'm not going to do anything complicated this evening. Just to ask what is God's kingdom and uh, and then to think about why we pray for it to come and uh, and then finally to think about how that affects our praying, how it changes uh, how we, we might pray uh, if we take these things and put them into practice. So let's think for a moment first about what God's kingdom actually is. Um, now you won't find the phrase, if you do a search on, on uh, if you've got Bible software or you look through a concordance, you won't find the phrase kingdom of God in the Old Testament at all. But you will see ideas of, of kingship and kingly rule all over the place, as you can imagine. Um, you can read it in Psalms like Psalm 2, I nearly read that this evening, um, but we read from Daniel instead. But you'll see that with all of the pictures there of, of the kings of the earth against God the king and against his king, the anointed one. You see it in a number of other Psalms about the enthronement of the king and David first, of course, but of course beyond that to the Messiah. And uh, we read about that 
kingdom in uh, in Daniel 2 that picture of the kingdoms of men but overruling them all God's God's kingdom the kingdom of God and so you'll see it there even if you won't find the phrase and you'll find God's rule and you'll find God's reign exerted all over the place over his people over their enemies especially at times like the exodus where, where God intervenes for his people's benefit and overrules those who are in power like Pharaoh and then when you come into the New Testament almost straight away you are introduced to the one from David's line, the one who is Emmanuel, the one who is signalled as the King of the Jews. So here's, um, here's Matthew chapter 2, just the first few verses there. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? Matthew's already done that with his genealogy, but here we see these foreigners coming. And they ask that question, where's the one who is the King of the Jews? Um, they saw his star and when King Herod heard this he was disturbed and he called together all the chief priests and teachers of the law and asked them when the Messiah was to be born they linked it they connected these things and following that as you know the wise men come and offer royal gifts to Jesus and then if you keep going through the gospels as John <coughs> begins preaching he proclaims the nearness of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven which is sort of practically the same thing and then when Jesus begins his ministry he says the same thing. So just one example verse, but he says it multiple times. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So the kingdom of God or, or the kingdom of heaven is prominent in the in the gospels. And it's, it's obviously not a place with, uh, with borders. It's not somewhere you, you sort of have a passport to enter, of course, but it's to be under the reign and the, the rule of the king, of King Jesus. It's to submit to him to own him as Lord, to listen to him so that you know what he wants to obey him. And it's not a political kingdom, as the <coughs> video made clear that if it was a political kingdom, it would look very different, wouldn't it? But it's not that. Uh, many wanted that from Jesus. They wanted to make him king by force at times. And uh, he, he rejected that. He walked away from that. His kingdom is not of this world. It's not like the other kingdoms. And uh, here, here's uh, Jesus speaking to the, the Pharisees of his days. This is Luke 17. Uh, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. So ask that question directly. Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst or within you. By which he means it's here with him, of course, with the acceptance of who he is, with believing in him and trusting in him and submitting to him. And so Jesus begins many of the parables that he tells with the phrase, the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven is like uh, a large expansive kingdom um, Daniel 2 made that clear didn't it one that that just pulverizes all the kingdoms of the world and and overtakes them it's a dynamic thing many of Jesus's pictures are organic um, examples pictures of seed and harvest and that kind of thing it's an abundant kingdom because there are frequent hints to this in those stories as well and it's a kingdom that is eternal that hasn't got an end it will last and it will outlast all the others Daniel 2 again makes that clear doesn't it all the other kingdoms come and they rise and some are less than others and then and then there's a kingdom which overrules them and which outlasts them and which will be forever so that's um, what this kingdom is that's what uh, it means the rule of God the rule of King Jesus how do you enter that kingdom? Well, it's obviously centers on Christ. It, it, it was there in the Old Testament as God's people submitted to his rule and his lordship, but it's coming to fall away in the Lord Jesus. And so John, John can say, and Jesus can say, it is near, it's, it's here, it's arrived. With the coming into the world of Christ and from the small beginning, the mustard seed of those early believers uh, in the New Testament, the kingdom is still advancing and growing surprisingly even when it is persecuted with great hostility it's still growing so God's kingdom is simply his rule and his reign where he is acknowledged as a rightful king and where he's honored as such and you can see how these petitions in the prayer connect together can't you by praying that God's name is hallowed and we look around and we see that that isn't the case uh, that God's name is not hallowed in this sinful world and not even really in our own hearts as it should be so our next prayer after praying for God's name to be holy is for God's kingdom to come for his rule, his reign to be experienced, to be seen and to be known. Um, 
Here's a, a little paragraph that I thought was helpful. This is John Stott um, from his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. He says this, The kingdom of God is his royal rule. As he is already holy, so he is already king, reigning in absolute sovereignty over both nature and history. Yet when Jesus comes, he announced a new and special breaking of the kingly rule of God, with all the blessings of salvation and the demands of submission which the divine rule implies. To pray that his kingdom may come is to pray both that it may grow, as through the church's witness people submit to Jesus, and that soon it will be consummated when Jesus returns in glory to take his power and reign. So we're, we've got those <coughs> sort of two views in mind. We're praying that his kingdom might come, it might grow, that more and more people might recognize and acknowledge King Jesus, and that we're praying soon it will be consummated when Christ returns and uh, comes to rule in glory. So that's God's kingdom. Um, there is another kingdom, isn't there, at, at work in this world, and it's at war with God's kingdom. The kingdom of, of Satan and darkness is a real thing, and the allegiance is one that we're born into naturally. Um, for a time, the devil is described as the god of this age. Paul describes him like that. And he's been given this limited authority in God's purposes. But God has broken in on this world and his kingdom in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus, the King of Kings. So we have nothing to fear if we're on the Lord's side, if we're joined to his kingdom and to his reign and to his rule. So we know something about who, uh, what this kingdom is. Why, why do we pray for it to come then? <coughs> it's Christ's kingdom, it's his rule and reign, and that will be seen um, in either the allegiance of those who follow him or those who turn away from him. So it's not an abstract thing, it's a reality in the lives of people in the way that we live too and the choices we make. So what's the prayer then here? It, it is for Christ's kingdom to come. Um, for Christ's kingdom to come. I read somewhere that... Um, uh, the word used here is a sort of an immediate and a quick uh, coming, not a gradual increasing coming. So the prayer for the disciples here perhaps was for the increase and spread and fruit of the gospel in their day to come quickly. But I think for us as well, it is to see God's rule and reign increase and, and spread in his world. Because how else will his name be hallowed if sinful hearts are not converted and changed to serve God instead of serving idols or serving themselves or anything else? So to pray for the kingdom to come is to pray that Satan's influence and rule might be diminished, might be reduced, that those things that bind people and control them and ruin their lives here might be overcome by the gospel and uh, by the truth of who Jesus is. So it begins with us. It must do, mustn't it? Because we, we know our own sinful hearts. We, ca we, can't, we can't kind of pray this for, you know, for, for our next door neighbour and, and think that we are unaffected. So f this prayer first for God's kingdom to come has a view of, our, of ourselves, of our own hearts. It is a, I think it is a heart searching prayer to examine our own hearts and to see who's on the throne. Um, our hearts really are um, factories of idols, aren't they? We make idols of just about anything. And so our prayer is a prayer of repentance really and seeking God's grace to, to give control to him, to, to be in submission to him, to follow him, to listen to him, to obey him and so you can see why this is built into the pattern of our regular praying you know if we pray for daily bread we pray this daily as well don't we for God's kingdom to come in our hearts first but then we might look beyond ourselves and think about the church and uh, to pray that God's kingdom would come among us as his people that we might live as a community of God's people faithful and consistent to him to his word we don't want to undermine the message of the gospel by our own failures to be the people of God together. That would be uh, utterly foolish, wouldn't it? We are, we are on mission together, and uh, so we are to be united in this. Otherwise, our message is, is undermined, isn't it, by a lack of love for one another. Just as our, our cohesion, our love for one another might be a witness, so uh, our lack of love will be the same. So we are to show that fruit of the Spirit towards one another. And that too is part of this prayer, isn't it, for God's kingdom to come. So we look at ourselves, we look at the church, and then we look out around at the world. And we see all the mess and all the rebellion and all the, the, the things that might make our hearts grieve. Uh, all the things in the news that we see each week. And uh, here is our prayer. God, you, may your kingdom come. Here's a, a, a great pattern to mould and shape a, a thousand different prayers for a thousand different circumstances. 
that God's kingdom might come, God's rule might be seen, that people might respond, might believe the gospel, might come and submit to the king. Uh, what do your uh, what do your atheist neighbours need more than anything? If you have atheist neighbours, they need to know there's a God who loves them and cares for them, has provided for their sin in the Lord Jesus. What do your moral upright uh, but self righteous friends and neighbours need more than anything else? To know that they can never be righteous on their own, earn their way to God. They need to come to Jesus and submit to Him. What do the nations and the cultures around the world that replace the truth of God with false gods and with ideas of God that aren't true, what do they need? They need to know who God is, that he is the God of such love that would cause him to come here, take on our flesh, come here in the person of his son to give himself for us. And you can put any situation there, can't you, that is, that is not <coughs> people living under the control of King Jesus. And what do they need? They need to come and recognize and acknowledge and and know the salvation of god's king so pray for god's kingdom pray for christ's rule to come and we pray that for our own hearts we pray it for local mission we pray for national mission for international mission that god's kingdom that our father's kingdom that christ's kingdom might come and that it might come soon there might be some urgency about that we're not we're not uh, indifferent to to how people live and so we pray for it to come, that God might have the glory, that his name might be hallowed. If that's the, the governing prayer, as some people think it is, then, then pray that his kingdom might come, that God's name would be recognised as holy. Uh, we're not praying, are we, for something here that won't happen otherwise. Um, God has the rule, he has the reign, he has the authority. But we're praying that we might see it and be part of it and experience it and that in this way, God would be honoured and glorified now in us and, and because of us in those around us. So we know something of, of what God's kingdom is, his rule and reign, and what we're praying for, we're praying that that might be seen in evidence. And so I just want you to think as we, we finish how that will affect your uh, praying. Um, think of the things that perhaps are concerning you as you scroll down the news or as you look at the newspapers or listen on TV or radio or something. Are you worried about those things in the world? Um, there ought to be some concern in us, oughtn't there, to, uh, to the things that we see. Maybe rulers and leaders exalting themselves, the suffering that we see. It's not wrong, of course, to pray for them. We ought to. The Bible commands us to. But we ought to... Um, to have a concern first for God's kingdom. There's a kind of priority, I think. Uh, and it's not for, you know, for, for our own country and our own interests. If we take the Bible seriously, we know, we know that even the strongest nation that there is, uh, given enough time, will one day, will one day cease, will one day uh, finish. So our concern is not to be overly worried about those things, our national interests or whatever, Wales' uh, interests or UK's interests but about God's kingdom, that's to be our first thought. And everything else can fail and fall, can't it? Because our treasure is, is in, in heaven with God. And God's kingdom can never fail or fall. So that ought to give some confidence to our praying and some focus and some priority. Uh, there will be things that we need to pray for, and things that are on our hearts. But uh, we're praying uh, in this prayer that above all of that, above all those other interests, God's kingdom might come. His rule might be evidenced and seen. Uh, we still haven't really got in this prayer, have we, to, to our own needs as such, to the things that we need each day to live. Um, our priorities are still being shaped by, by God's, uh, the holiness of God's name and his kingdom and his will being done. So that ought to, to affect our, our praying. Um, we know that this kingdom is one that will last, it will remain, it's a kingdom that is growing and, and uh, we can depend on God fully in that. Um, these words from the 2 Peter came to mind, just thinking about how our view of the world and, and God's kingdom ought to affect the way that we think of the things here. So Peter says this, since everything will be destroyed, he's speaking about the end of all things when God will bring an end. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. 
So Peter tells his friends, the coming kingdom of God, that day when it will be revealed, it ought to change everything, how we handle uh, the stuff of this world, how we live here and now. And um, he says in some way here, we might speed its coming and by taking the gospel to the nations, by filling the world with the truth of God. So here's our hope, here's our goal. Even if we don't see this kingdom in great evidence now, and we don't see it greatly around us, do we? We pray for it and we trust that God will answer that prayer and he will bring it to fruition. Um, there's quite a few bits in Revelation. I was just searching for various references to the kingdom of God. And there's a number of references in Revelation, but let me just read this one uh, just as we come to a close. The seventh angel, Revelation 11, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. So uh, God is gonna uh, break in and uh, overtake uh, those kingdoms like the rock in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's vision. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. With, no, uh, with nothing, nobody to uh, challenge that reign, God will one day have the, the ultimate rule and reign over all things. So as you pray this week, as we pray, we pray to a Father in heaven, a God who loves us. We pray that his name might be recognized and seen and known. And that increasingly in our lives and in the lives of those around us and in our world, we pray that Christ will reign, that Christ will rule over everything for his glory. Amen. Let me pray for us. Lord, we do thank you that you are the king uh, who is on a throne, uh, on the throne of, of this universe, not just of, of our world, but of all that you've made. And we thank you, Lord, that you are king. And we pray that, Lord, we might see your, your rule over all things. Lord, we don't presently see that in all its fullness because, Lord, this is a, a sinful world and a broken world. And we see so many... Uh, seeking to be king of their own lives and lord so many seeking to reject your authority and rule and living in rebellion against you and uh, lord we would pray that your kingdom might come lord we pray that this might be the the means of your name being hallowed and glorified and lifted up and lord we pray that first for ourselves and then we pray for our neighborhood and our community here we pray for bridgend and for the uk and for this world lord that is uh, lord is so broken by its rebellion so broken by its sin Lord, would you come and reign in our lives and would, Lord, we pray, by the Gospels, preaching and, uh, and being made known, Lord, would you bring that rule into the lives of others that they might know the fullness of it, that they might know the joy, Lord, of, of serving you, that, Lord, you are the one who came to serve us, to give yourself for us. And so, Lord, we pray that your kingdom might come, Lord. Help us in our praying to pray aright, we pray, and, uh, Lord, not to uh, rush to our own needs, but to pray for these these big prayers, Lord, uh, that, Lord, you might be uh, at work in us, Lord, in our church, in our community, and in our lives. Father, help us and hear our prayer, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.